but really it's more of like a game type activity with a live demo at the end. Um, but we are the UNICEF blockchain team. Fun fact, UNICEF has a blockchain team. <laughs> um, but we are part, yeah, exciting stuff. My name is Ariana, and we have... My name is Chris. And my name is Moran. I'm Christina. And we are the UNICEF blockchain team. We're based in New York at the UNICEF headquarters. Um, so if you don't know, UNICEF is the UN Children's Foundation, or Children's Fund, I should say. Um, and we are part of the innovation team. As I mentioned, we explore emerging and frontier technologies for UNICEF and kind of these cases for the broader UN. Um, so today we will be talking about connectivity um, and the importance of designing with constraints in mind. So at UNICEF, we are focused on certain program countries. So these are countries that are low resource, have high con um, resource constraints, meaning that they don't have access to all the same resources as developed countries. And so today we will be doing like a, I guess an immersive game, which are what all these tables are for, to help you think about when you're designing your dApps or your different programs, what it may be like to have internet and connectivity constraints. Cool. Thank you. So the basic agenda is that I'm going to talk for 12 minutes or so, and then we get to try out this game. But before we do that, um, can you just, if you have a phone, can you hold up your phone? If you have one phone. If you have two phones, can you hold up two phones? <laughs> no? Yeah! Two phones, okay. Uh, if you've got a Nokia 1100, <laughs> anybody have a Nokia? This is the best phone ever made. Remember this? It would like, the, phone, the charge would last for like seven days, and it had one game, which was that one. Um, our team looks a lot at how we can design solutions for people who may be using a phone that's closer to this than to the computer, the supercomputer almost that we all have in our pockets and hands. And so we wanted just to spend that first 10 minutes to talk about why this is important um, to everybody in this room and to the world that we live in. Uh, as Ariana said, UNICEF is this really old organization. It's 70 years old. Uh, it works in every country in the world in some way or another, and it has this a $7 billion a year budget, which is stuff that I don't think we knew when we joined the organization. But it's a big market-shaping organization as well. And so when it starts to buy things like pencils, well, more importantly, like vaccines, it begins to also shape global markets, which is kind of interesting. It uses that huge amount of money to influence the way that companies produce products and goods. And this is really important because our world is faced with a huge number of issues now that we weren't faced with 10 years ago. And one of the examples is the outbreak of Ebola that we're finding moving quickly through the DR Congo uh, and elsewhere in sort of the region, although still not a ton of cases have appeared around Congo. Uh, but Ebola is a disease that spreads quite quickly, and it spreads particularly where there isn't a lot of information around it. Uh, and we want to just give two examples. We'll talk about Ebola, we'll talk about schools. One of these is happier than the other. The Ebola one is the less happy. So, as we look at how we as an organization can work with governments to predict where a disease like Ebola is going to spread, you can do it really easily in a well-connected city. If you remember the Google flu trend stuff from about five, ten years ago, as you get a lot of data points um, from all the stuff that we're generating on our rich phones, these, it's pretty easy to track where an epidemic is spreading. Um, but if you're out in eastern DR Congo there, and I ask you where is Ebola going to spread, it's pretty hard to tell me as an epidemiologist or a data scientist. Um, if you ask me where people are, it's pretty hard to tell me because this thing is pinging a whole bunch of towers and Wi-Fi hotspots and everything else and we're gathering, like Facebook's gathering all the creepy information about us that we don't want it to and network operators are also, but that provides a web of connectivity that allows us to know where people are in the connected world. But in the world of the Nokia 1100 or less, it's really hard to figure out what kind of data is being generated and it's really hard to figure out where people are moving. And where people are moving is where diseases move, right? So. If you want to track, if you're an epidemiologist, you want to track a disease, you look at where people move because where a person moves, a disease goes. Um, but this is the type of tool that we often use to track diseases. And so when we were, our team was in Liberia during the last Ebola outbreak in 2014, this was a, a map, the type of map that we used. This was updated, the refresh rate of this was like every two days, and you couldn't zoom in on it very well. Um, and so that was the type of map that we were using to figure out where Ebola was moving in Liberia. However, the type of stuff that we're able to do with data scientists and with a team of pretty smart people is to look at how you can take the type of thin data that comes out of a mobile phone like this, aggregate it, and turn it into intuitions about where a disease is spreading. And in fact, we've done this 
in DR Congo, and you can see uh, some of the results of our work here, which is that we're able to predict where populations are moving by debiasing mobile phone data. And that's really important because those diseases affect all of us. They affect us, us in this room here, they affect people in Geneva, in Stockholm, in New York, um, because we're suddenly a connected world. But we're not an evenly connected world. Um, if you look at a country like Mauritania, this is a map of Mauritania as seen through data science, and the white triangles here are roads. Those are roads which have mobile phone towers on them. That's what those triangles are, so that's a cell tower. The dots are schools. The schools in blue are schools that have 2G. The schools in yellow have 3G connectivity. So in the 2G schools, you can send a text message. It's kind of neat. In the schools that are gold or yellow, you can do something more sophisticated. The schools that are red, those dots there, have no connectivity at all. That's where there's no signal. There's no way to get to a teacher and make a call to understand whether a disease is going to spread. And if you ask a doctor or an epidemiologist, they'll tell you that if Ebola starts here, it'll spread along this corridor. And again, that's an intuition that we have in a connected world very easily. We can gather that data. But it's really hard to do if we don't have good connectivity. Obviously, if you have connectivity, you also have tons of opportunities for businesses, for building apps, for looking at the next generation of users. But the user experience has to be very different. Because if you're using something like this, it's really hard to think about all the stuff that we sometimes take into account when we're designing for a smartphone. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about that with you today. And we've all come to a hotel where you haven't had Wi-Fi, and that's the most important thing, more important than getting into your room. So we're all kind of familiar with that Maslow's hierarchy of like getting connected. But we wanted to actually put ourselves in a position for the next 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes, uh, where we run ourselves through a game about connectivity. And we'll explain why later on. Connectivity is a global problem. Um, we've been mapping connectivity in countries like Brazil and Colombia. These are the same maps that we showed you in Mauritania, in Kyrgyzstan. And the number of schools, all those dots, the red dots, without connectivity is huge. There's no way to solve that with traditional money. There's not enough dollars to put into solving that problem right now. And we need to think about other sources of value, other ways that we can inject capital into the system to connect people, to generate the data that we need to be safe, but also to ensure that people all over the world have access to the opportunities that can be taken for granted in a connected world. Um, and so this question of access to information is what we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so doing with some Legos. Uh, we're going to look at what it means to be connected. We're going to challenge you to do something very frustrating, which is solve a challenge where you don't have access to your phones for the whole time. Um, the test group that we did this, so you're going like, to have your phone for a little bit, put it away for a little bit, it'll all become clear in the instructions. The test group that we did this with almost revolted against us because they found it so frustrating to do simple things like figure out a song lyric without access to the Google. Which is tough, but we're gonna try to do it together and you may be frustrated at the end, but you'll feel a sigh of relief as you get your device back and you're not gonna lose it at that point, but as you are able to be connected again. Um, but the reason we're gonna challenge you to that is because we believe we'd like to propose a solution to this. We'd like to propose a set of thinkings around how we could create some of this connectivity uh, and use all of your brains in the room to do that. So the end of this is redemptive in a way, even if you do stage a revolt, um, because we're gonna look at some solutions for how we prepare for the jobs of the future, how we start to get in front of some of these pandemics that are spreading, how we monitor things like climate change where they're not happening in urban environments, and how we start to deal with people who are stateless, who are disconnected, who are immediately out of the whole informational context that we're working on. So. I wanted to pause there. We're going to go into the next round, but again, to say thank you to all of our team and to Yaz, where are you in the back of the room, who's joined us from Tokyo from the UNICEF office there, and Hubert, where are you, who's joined us from UNICEF France as well. So there are a few other colleagues of ours who are here, um, and very excited to see how angry and frustrated we can get as we become disconnected for the next half hour, and how we can work together to build something pretty exciting. Thank you. Sweet, okay, game. game time. So what we're going to do for the next 40 minutes is there will be a video that we will queue up um, that will begin with instructions. And so we're gonna ask you for the next 40 minutes to put on your role-playing hat. The game is framed through the lens of being a spy and having to solve different challenges and puzzles to channel your inner James Bond and get ready to solve some challenges through being disconnected. So you will see on the video and we'll have the mic, the sound system's a bit off, so we will have the mic next to the speaker on the laptop. 
Um, but there will be sound cues, so for some parts of the game you'll be able to use your phone, for other parts of the game you won't be able to use your phone. As Chris said, it's going to seem confusing. There's instructions also in the bags on the table, but we're going to take a few minutes and allow you to self-organize around the table. So ideally there are about 20 to 30 people at each table, um, and then we'll give you time to get adjusted, and then we will cue the game. So we'll take a couple minutes now. You can stand up. You can bring your phone with you. And then we... Yeah, so there's 30 people, max 30 people per table. <laughs> So self-organize really quickly. Then I'm gonna remove the table. Introduce yourself, make a friend. Okay, great. Thumbs up. Okay. So it, it might not be exact, we didn't like count all of you off, but we will now play the video. And so again, to give you a background, the video the video will have instructions, so there's going to be like a narrator who is giving instructions. They do go kind of fast, which is why we've included a printed version of the instructions. And then we're going to play the video for 40 minutes, and it has the time cues for the game. So the video will be playing for the next 40 minutes. And here we go. Hello, spies. Welcome to your training session. A notorious thief has stolen several rare and expensive items and has hidden them in different locations. Your task will be to figure out what has been stolen, where it has been hidden, and collect further instructions from one of our agents by giving them the top secret Go code. For the location, you'll find a series of cards on the table with this icon. For the image, you'll find cards with this icon. You'll definitely need the internet for this one. For the Go code, you'll find cards with this icon and Legos. A Go code is a series of numbers that will translate to a phrase such as, the eagle has landed. <laughs> Separate yourselves into groups according to which task you'd like to do. Would you like to find an Or would you like to find an image? Or maybe you'd like to work on a go code. Then, one of the spies will shuffle the deck and deal cards to each spy, including themselves. Throughout the session, you'll see a green sign, which means you can use your phones and show your cards to other spies. You'll also see a red sign, which means to put your phones down and to take your cards back into your hand. Do not show them to other people. Remember, even when there is an internet, there is always something to do. Once you've finished with the image, recreate it by drawing it on a cue card. Once you've finished with the goat code, show it to the facilitator. If you get it right, they will give you further instructions in an envelope. If you get it wrong, well, better luck next time at another Spy Academy. <laughs> so within the deck of cards that you have, there are actually three sets within that. So one set has eyes on one side, one set has the magnifying glass, and one set has numbers. And so the idea is that if there's 30 people, each person gets a card, so there's three sub-teams within your team of 30. So don't start the game yet, but divvy yourselves up, make sure everyone has a card, do not show your cards to anyone. So the video will have the next prompt, so once you've completed that task, just wait for the video to play. So if you split up in your groups, make sure everyone has a card. Does this happen? Give me a thumbs up when everyone has a card. Oh, we have an advanced team over here. Already. Yeah, so if you have a team that doesn't have 30 cards, some people may have to have two cards, just as a heads up. But ideally, it'd be one card per person. Yeah, you're, you're doing it right. Keep going. So yeah, give me a thumbs up when you got that. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Still some thumbs. Half a thumb. Okay, cool. Good? Okay. I'm going to fast forward because you guys are so advanced. Maybe. That corner. Cool, okay. The game will begin in... Oh, cool. 
<laughs> okay, if you need a refresher on the instructions, they're on your table.